Hello and welcome to the Suburban Wasteland. With me, Echo Gecko. In the past, we've discussed how suburbs are universally damaging to those that live in them and the environment around them. In this episode, however, we're going to focus in on how suburbs are especially harmful to one specific but very important group, children and adolescents. Let's get started. Before we dive in though, we have to establish a basic fact. Since the 1970s, researchers all over the developed world have observed a collapse in what is termed child-independent mobility, or the ability of children to go to school, park, or a friend's house, and so on, on their own. According to a 2008 study, only about a third of American children ever walked or biked to school in the 2000s, a 40% drop since 1977. By 2009, this had declined to only 13%, according to the National Center for Safe Routes to School. This isn't unique to the United States. A 2005 study in Australia found that while nearly two-thirds of children walked to elementary school in 1974, nearly 90% were instead being driven by 2005. Meanwhile, a 2001 study found that in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, less than half of 10-year-old children were allowed to visit places other than school alone, catch public transport alone, or bike along main roads. Finally, a 2014 study in Great Britain finds that, quote, 80% of 7- to 8-year-old children in the UK were permitted to travel home from school on their own in 1971, compared with just 9% in 1990 and 6% in 2010, unquote. More recent evidence from a 2018 paper finds that just between 1990 and 2010, the proportion of kids allowed to come home from school alone dropped by 30% in England and over 50% in Australia. The authors of that 2014 study conclude that, quote, many children in developed countries now primarily experience their neighborhood through a car window as parents habitually chauffeur them to and from school and other destinations." Unquote. Before we get into the consequences of this, and there are many very negative consequences, it's important to establish that suburbanization is the cause of this decline. As we've discussed in previous videos in this series, suburbs, and especially contemporary American suburbs, have certain characteristics very low density, looping cul-de-sac street layouts, few trees and sidewalks, and large, single-use tracts. All of these features facilitate an autocentric lifestyle at the expense of walking, biking, and other modes of transit. That is to say, all the modes children can use independently. Plenty of research confirms this as the cause in the decline of child-independent mobility. For example, a 2002 study of households with children by the Center for Disease Control found that, quote, long distances and dangerous motor vehicle travel were the most commonly reported barriers to active travel, unquote. A 2008 study, which conducted focus groups with parents and children in suburban North Carolina, found that, quote, Lack of sidewalks or discontinuous sidewalks were seen as a barrier because they made walking to school more dangerous." Unquote. A common feature of many modern developments that forces residents to walk and bike on the road itself. Curiously, the researchers found that, quote, "...distance was reported as a problem for several participants, despite the fact that they all lived within a mile and a half from school." Unquote. Even if you live nearby to where you need to go, the built environment is so hostile that parents considered it unacceptable for children to walk. Furthermore, a 2019 Canadian paper finds that, quote, suburban environments were negatively associated with boys' independent mobility, while walkability was positively associated with girls' independent mobility, unquote. A 2007 study summarizes the outstanding evidence, quote, a large and sprawling urban context, more intense traffic, few play areas near home, 
and parental anxiety over traffic and social dangers have a negative effect on children's autonomous mobility." Unquote. Parental anxieties about child safety in the suburbs are, to a degree, justified. While that North Carolina study did find that stranger danger was a prominent fear among parents, child being stalked by a predator. She tried to take two young children at Hartsfield Jackson International Airport. It's every parent's nightmare caught on video. It happened so fast. You can see the man grab seven year old Brittany Baxter. The authors note that, quote, the actual risks of abduction overall are substantially lower than risks of injury from automobile accidents, drowning, burns, pedestrian injuries, and bicycle injuries, unquote. In contrast, the risk of child death by car is very real. According to the CDC, about 600 kids under the age of 13 were killed in car crashes in 2018, and nearly 100,000 were injured. The number of deaths rises to 4,000 if teenagers are included, or about 20% of all deaths in that age bracket. In both cases, Car collisions were the number one cause of death for children and teenagers. A 2017 Canadian study found that, quote, road traffic injuries are the leading cause of preventable child death in Canada and are the leading cause of unintentional injury death in those ages 0 to 24, unquote. Importantly, the study also found that, quote, higher residential land use density had a protective effect, unquote, against car collisions with child pedestrians, with a nearly 50% decline in collision risk for children in high-density areas. In response to this danger, parents have begun to universally ferry their children in cars, and as a result, the rate of child pedestrian death has plummeted. But this has come with other costs. First of all, Plummeting child independent mobility likely contributed to skyrocketing child overweight and obesity over the same period. We discussed this in much more detail in a previous video, and so I won't get too into it here, though I will point out a 2003 study in the Philippines which found that simply walking to or from school burned between 6 and 8,000 calories a year. Quote, thereby avoiding a weight gain of 2 to 3 pounds per year." Unquote. An important finding at a time when American childhood obesity continues to skyrocket. The suburban threat to child welfare stretches far beyond physical health, however. A 2013 study by a group of Italian researchers found that among children, quote, Lower independent mobility predicted greater feelings of loneliness through the mediation of a weaker sense of community, a lower sense of safety, and less frequent social activities with friends." Unquote. A 2007 study had similar findings, concluding that, quote, "...higher autonomous mobility and higher use of public spaces for play in childhood predicted less intense fear of crime and a stronger sense of community in adolescence." Unquote even when controlling for local crime levels, and, quote, a better relationship with community predicted less pervasive feelings of loneliness, unquote. Suburban life, it turns out, makes children quite lonely. A 1995 study, which over the course of five years interviewed focus groups of parents and children in A families, in walkable urban settings, and B families, in car-oriented suburban ones, suggests why this might be. It finds that suburban children, quote, do not have even half as many playmates in the immediate neighborhood as children from A families, unquote. The study also found that suburban life places special strain on the parents of children as well. Not only did A family parents know more people in the neighborhood than B parents, 81 average acquaintances versus 37, but they could more easily use those relationships to secure childcare when needed. Quote, 95% of all A parents have neighbors who take care of their child, whereas in the case of B parents, only 60% do. Unquote. Unlike the children in A families, children in B families could not typically go out to play on their own. As a result, quote, 
Altogether, over 80% of the B parents find it necessary to organize opportunities for their child to play with other children. In comparison, only 40% of the A parents consider this a necessity." Unquote. Importantly, the researchers found that A children, which could go out with friends unsupervised and indicated here by the black bars, engage in more creative and social play, such as drawing with chalk, playing team and self-invented games, and sharing toys. This contrasted with B family children, whose play was typically confined to playgrounds and supervised by adults. The authors therefore suggest that a suburban upbringing may literally impair a child's cognitive development, even when controlling for income and other factors. Of course, this study assumes that suburban children even have playgrounds, which is increasingly not the case. The play structures I've been featuring in the background aren't stock photos from the internet, but part of a series I captured in a Midwest suburb several years ago. Even though I took all of these on a sunny day in the middle of summer vacation, every single one is deserted. It turns out that these private substitutes for public play are not especially appealing. In turn, constantly needing to chauffeur and supervise children places a huge strain on suburban parents. As reported in a 2001 study, a British government report in 1990 estimated that the total cost of parents transporting kids every year was somewhere between 10 and 20 billion pounds, taking into account time, gas, and maintenance costs. In addition, the constant need to chauffeur children has contributed to huge traffic problems, with a 1995 UK study suggesting that up to 20% of all rush hour traffic was parents on the school run with kids. Ironically, quote, parents driving their children to school are one of the major causes of the traffic danger that the parents themselves are trying to avoid, unquote. Suburban traffic may also have another indirect negative effect on children. A 2021 study, which aggregated commute and survey data from across the US, found that, quote, overall commute time between work to home was positively and significantly related to work interfering with family, unquote, with respondents with longer commutes consistently reporting having to cut down on family activities. Importantly, the researchers report that, quote, compared to urban residents, suburban residents commute significantly longer, unquote, even controlling for socioeconomic factors. As a result, there is, quote, a significant indirect effect of suburban living on work-family conflict through commute, unquote. Curiously, the paper finds that rural residents also generally have relatively shorter commutes. Suburbs really do seem to be the worst of both worlds keeping families apart even as suburban planning keeps children stuck indoors. As for the kids themselves, the constant chauffeuring made necessary by contemporary suburban design has another, more surprising negative effect. In a 2002 study, researchers presented children with blank maps of their neighborhood and asked them to draw, as accurately as possible, their daily route to school on the map. The results were quite dramatic. Children that walked to school, alone or with their parents, drew detailed maps indicating in detail crosswalks, shops, and local landmarks, and correctly mapping their route to school. Kids that were driven, meanwhile, drew this. <sighs> the paper actually includes the kid's actual route to school, and even though the kid is literally just driven around the block, they don't even get the turns right. <clears throat> Anyways, after analyzing the maps drawn by about 50 children, the researchers conclude that, quote, the overall representation of the home school itinerary was significantly better in children who do the journey on their own, unquote, compared to all other groups. The ability to autonomously explore one's environment is critical to developing both spatial awareness and a sense of comfort with one's surroundings, and restricting this autonomy, quote, 
may hinder the acquisition of spatial skills as it restricts knowledge of the environment and jeopardizes the development of children's independence." Unquote. But the consequences of losing out on this development of independence can be much more severe. A 2007 paper combines a broad pool of research to highlight the greatest consequences of quote, restricted independent mobility and environmental play and learning for children, unquote. In addition to reduced environmental competence and fewer opportunities to develop social skills, which we already discussed, such restrictions may also impair the development of a sense of purpose, self-confidence, or self-esteem. Difficulty developing a sense of self-efficacy, or the belief in one's abilities to manage and find solutions to everyday problems, and may make children less capable of handling and recovering from stressful or risky situations, also known as resilience. This latter point is especially interesting, and the paper's author argues that contemporary children are part of a quote, bubble wrap generation, unquote, excessively supervised and controlled by parents extremely worried about their children's safety. It's hysteria, she says. The world is safer today than it has ever been, even as the push to bubble wrap children keeps growing. This is a much broader topic beyond the scope of this video, but the pattern of suburban developments, which largely restricts children's play to supervised living rooms and backyards and strips away any ability of children to move around without their parents, is a major component. The authors of a 2014 paper summarized the situation well. Quote, Although well-intentioned, this almost zero-tolerance approach to risk unintentionally but adversely inhibits children's social, emotional, and physical development." Unquote. Near the start of this video, I cited this table from a 2001 paper to demonstrate how little autonomy children in suburbanized countries have. I blacked out one of the columns at the time. That missing column contains the equivalent statistics for Germany. Unlike Australia, New Zealand, and the UK, never mind the much worse situation in the US, a majority of German 10-year-olds were permitted to take public transit on their own, 4 in 5 are allowed to visit places other than school on their own, and a whopping 96% are trusted to get themselves home from school. The blacked out row from the 2018 study contained more updated numbers, which indicated that even in 2010, the vast majority of German children could still come home on their own. If we want to address the problems we've discussed today, a good place to start would be to study what Germany, and countries like it, are doing right. The authors of this paper do exactly this, in fact. While, quote, there is no single explanation for the much higher levels of children's freedom in the German cities, unquote, the authors suggest a few possibilities. For one, German cities, suburbs, and villages are generally built quite densely, and so more destinations, like schools and friends' houses, are within easy walking distances for children. This was supplemented by high-quality transit systems, whose high frequency made it more convenient for children to use, while the resulting high passenger counts made them safer spaces for children. Similarly, more walkable spaces reassured parents that their kids would be safe from both physical and social dangers. Quote, more children, and people generally, were out on the streets in German cities, and this in itself gave children and parents more confidence in allowing children more freedom, as there was a greater number of people about who knew each other's children and could look out for them." Unquote. This last point is especially important, because according to a 2013 study we cited earlier, even in car-oriented areas, quote, parents are often aware that greater outdoor autonomy would help their children grow and become responsible, unquote. Parents know that independence is important, but are constrained by fear of harm to their children, especially disproportionate and irrational fear of abduction. Hence, the North Carolina study we cited early in this video concludes that, quote, a supportive physical environment 
is a necessary but insufficient condition to encourage active travel, unquote, and that parental attitudes need to be changed as well. But these attitudes are in turn a product of the suburban environment. As we mentioned earlier, there is empirical evidence that childhood autonomy predicts fear of crime later in life, even controlling for actual crime level, while a 2015 study found that, quote, parents who had relatively risk-free lives focused more on protecting children from harm and preventing them from making mistakes, unquote. While parents that themselves had experienced risk in their lives, quote, were better able to balance safety and adventure and offer their children opportunities to manage everyday risk and uncertainty." Unquote. Unfortunately, the suburban attitude seems to reproduce itself in every next generation, as excessively sheltered parents produce excessively sheltered children. In concluding their analysis of child walkability, Tranter and Pawson state that, quote, all the characteristics of a child-friendly city are the same characteristics that would lead to a cleaner environment, less energy-greedy transport systems, a more equitable society with more participatory democracy, and safe and welcoming public spaces." Unquote. Suburban development which prioritizes drivers gives motorists a great degree of freedom, but in the process it strips away that freedom from those that cannot drive. This of course includes children, but also seniors too old to drive, the disabled, and of course, those that cannot afford a car. In turn, advocating for child-friendly cities means advocating for cities that are better for everybody. The famous transformation of Dutch cities from car-oriented zones into green, friendly, and pedestrianized spaces was initially spearheaded by the Stop de Kindermoor, or Stop the Child Murder campaign in the 70s, after more than 500 kids were killed by cars in a single year. Yet the results are felt by everybody. A world where children are confined to their own backyards and driven everywhere by parents is a worse world for almost all of us. Building child-friendly cities, in contrast, benefits not only children but everybody else living in them thanks for watching